for a moment as people continue to filter in. Okay. All right, so we can get started while everyone is still joining. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff with Politics and Pros. I'd like to welcome you to another PNP Live. Um, before we do get started with this event, just a couple of quick items. Uh, the first is if you have any questions for our author, we would ask for you to place it in the Q&A box, which you can find uh, on the bottom of your screen, um, not the chat section, just to help us keep everything kind of organized and facilitate the question answer period. Additionally, in the chat section, you will be able to find a link uh, which will take you directly to the Politics of Rose website where you can purchase a copy of Where the Stars Begin to Fall. Of course, we highly encourage you to do so, to buy multiple copies if you would like. <laughs> um, of course, um, we thank you for any patronage as this continues to help us bring you these live events. And also, last thing is that this event is in partnership with the Brennan Center for Justice. When the Stars Begin to Fall makes a compelling, ambitious case for a pathway to the national solidarity necessary to mitigate racism, weaving memories of his own and his family's multi-generational experience with, with racism, alongside strands of history into his elegant narrative, Johnson posits that a blueprint for national solidarity can be found in the exceptional citizenship long practice in Black America. Understanding that racism is a structural crime of the state, he argues that overcoming it requires us to recognize that a color conscious society, not a color blind one, is the true fulfillment of the American promise. Fueled by Johnson's ultimate faith in the American project, grounded in his family's longstanding optimism and his own military service, when the stars begin to fall, is an urgent call to undertake the process of overcoming what has long seemed intractable. Theodore R. Johnson is a senior fellow and director of the Fellows Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law, where he undertakes research on race, politics, and American identity. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, he was a national fellow at New America and a commander in the United States Navy, serving for 20 years in a variety of positions, including as a White House fellow in the first Obama administration and as speechwriter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His work on race relations has appeared in prominent national publications across the political spectrum, including the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and National Review, among several others. Johnson is in conversation today with Ms. Karen Finney. Karen Finney is a CNN political commentator, consultant, and thought leader who has worked at the intersection of media, politics, and cultural change for over 30 years. Her political work predominantly focuses on electing women and candidates of color, including Hillary Clinton and Stacey Abrams, and examining support for Black women's political leadership, attitudes about racism, criminal justice, and police re policing reform, and mobilizing infrequent Black and Brown voters. In addition to her consulting work, she currently hosts Represent Your Voice on TV One and previously hosted Disrupt with Karen Finney on MSNBC. She also writes frequently about race, gender, and politics. Without any further ado, Ms. Finney, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so honored and thank everyone up front for, for joining us. Again, a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A box. We, are, we got a lot to get through. This is a phenomenal book, such an important book, um, but I really wanna make sure we have time for your questions. So Ted, I'm so excited. Um, I was joking with Ted before he started that I felt like I was in grad school reading this book <laughs> because I was like studying, but it's, let me start with kind of, you know, part of my work is as a communications person is around storytelling mm -hmm. and what are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about our country, about, you know, different issues. And the thing that struck me, I mean, obviously it's so beautifully uh, written mm -hmm. um, and so beautifully weave in personal story, stories about amazing Black Americans, in addition to philosophy and history and social science concepts, so many rich 
traditions threaded together. Yeah. But what, what, um, what stuck out to me when I read this book, just as a place for us to start, is I kept hearing in my head the Langston Hughes poem, uh, Let America Be America Again. Mm. And this book feels to me sort of taking that poem and extending into what that could look like. Uh, you know, if we acknowledge the pain, acknowledge, you know, the wrongs, reframe how we talk about that story and the story we tell ourselves about the founding of our country and the story we want to tell about our country to, and then move forward. And I just want to read a part from the poem that stuck out and then ask you to respond, react to that idea. In the poem, Langston Hughes says, oh yes, I say it plain. Mm -hmm. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. And so I just wanna open with that and get your thoughts. Yeah, so thank you uh, so much, both to Politics and Pros and to you, Karen, for, for um, being with me tonight and to, to talk about this book and tell more folks about it. And that stanza you read from the poem, um, the Langston Hughes poem, is exactly the right one because it is both a sign of disappointment in the nation that we've had uh, at points in history and even to some, some extent today, and an optimism and, and, and he says, you know, I, I swear this oath, like a declaration that the country that we have not yet realized is possible and it's coming about. And that is the, the spirit of the book is, is encapsulated in, in that stanza. Uh, look, this, this book generally tries to, to tell the reader that the things wrong with our country are not to be found in people different from us. That the things wrong with this country are to be found in the way the promise of America has been underdelivered to all of us, and that those with power have exploited racism, racial tensions, as a way of dividing the people so that it doesn't have to be responsive to any of us in full. The story of America is a story of a country that was founded on the idea that all men are created equal and enslaved people as it made that declaration. It is a story of a nation that was uh, initially very exclusive about who could be a citizen and slowly over time has become more inclusive of who can participate in our democracy, not without growing pains, not without shortfalls and, 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 uh, and uh, vulnerabilities, but, um, and yet still over time, we have become closer to the ideal of America that is in our sacred text. Um, and, and move further away from our founding um, character, the, the nature at, at our inception. Long ways to go before we get there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, I, I think that's sort of where our conversation will go tonight is, is, yes. uh, is, is how to get there. Yes. So let's start with that. Let's start with the framework, because I want us to all kind of, for those who are joining us um, via the interwebs, and thank you all again for joining us. Let's start with sort of the core principles. I've heard you talk about sort of the three main pillars, if you will, mm -hmm. that the book is founded on. I wonder if you would talk about that again, just to give people a sense of the framework for the book. Right, absolutely. So I, I have called this book a three-legged stool of three-legged stools. There are these three batches of three ideas that basically stitch the whole book together. But the main stool, the main set of ideas are these three. The first is that Structural racism is an existential threat to America. And when I say this, I, I mean that um, America, the idea that we're all created equal, that we have these unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, cannot coexist with racism, with racial inequality. And I'm not talking about the racism in people's hearts, how one group of people feels about another group. I'm talking about the way our society is structured, the way it is built, the way that it has been fashioned through uh, centuries of public policy to advantage some people over others for no fault of th those of us here today, no fault of our own. We were born into a society that was structured, uh, had built in certain advantages for some groups and certain disadvantages for other groups. So that kind of inequality cannot coexist with the idea that we're all created equal and we have these unalienable rights. And when I say a threat to America, I mean America the idea, not the United States. 
And the United States, a nation state, a geopolitical entity, has proven over the course of its history it, that it can live quite comfortably at times with racism, uh, slavery, Jim Crow, Native Americans, uh, immigrants, even from you know folks we would call white today from Ireland or, or Poland or Italy, two centuries ago, 150 years ago, 100 years ago, um, weren't accepted as and weren't welcomed. So this is this is the, the nation itself um, is, is sometimes okay with oppressing certain groups, but the idea of America is never okay with it. So the, so the United States may persist, even if we begin backsliding, sliding, uh, we fashion some uh, new liberal society. Um, the, the idea of America, however, cannot live in, in that way. So that's the first idea. And the, mm -hmm. the, the second is that national solidarity is the best chance we have to overcome racism. I don't think we can ever create a society where racism is completely gone. I don't think it's possible to erase racism, especially not given our history. But I do think it's possible to mitigate the effects of racism in our society. Uh, I've, I've said before that I'm much happier being a 20, uh, black man in 2021 than in 1921 or 1821. So um, th there is progress that, that the nation has made, um, but it doesn't suggest that we've arrived. But over that time, the effects of racism have been mitigated, but not erased. And so national solidarity is, gives us our best chance of doing that. And then the third is that black America contains lessons for how to construct this national solidarity, this kind of connection uh, among Americans across race, ethnicity, class, region, customs, culture, language, religion, et cetera, uh, to form a multiracial egalitarian democracy. Uh, the, the, importantly, the, the assertion is not that black Americans exclusively hold the key to how to build a national solidarity, but every group those I just named and, and those that I didn't like, for example, the experience of women in this country, they have all of these groups that have been excluded from citizenship, excluded from the promise, um, have lessons to teach the country about how to achieve a better form of democracy, a more inclusive participatory, participatory form of democracy. And so this book talks specifically about the lessons that Black America has from uh, our arrival here in, in the nation all the way through to today. So I wanna go dig a little bit in just the, these core themes and some of the other themes you talk about. I'm gonna start with national solidarity because obviously it's something, you know, many, we talk a lot about and think a lot about. We're in this moment where I remember during the election seeing in people's neighborhoods, you know, uh, yard signs and some people had t-shirts that said, literally said things like, um, equal rights for others doesn't mean fewer, doesn't mean fewer rights for you. Right. It's not pie. And I, you know, I was like, oh man, if I got to put that on a t-shirt for you, we're really <laughs> in trouble. So, but that being said, when we talk about national solidarity in the book, as you talk about it, what does that require mm -hmm. of people? Because clearly we are very divided and obviously racism is a part of it, but we're divided on so many different lines. And I think yet yeah, you're trying to lift for this conversation, lift us out of that into something else. I want you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So national solidarity, uh, as I define it in the book, is essentially a combination of political and civic solidarities. Political, political solidarity is when people come together over some cause of justice or some, some moral issue, and they stand together in, in support of this moral, or, or, or moral issue or cause of justice. Um, mm -hmm. Civic solidarity is when uh, the, the social contract between the public and the nation state uh, is, is breached um, by the state. And civic solidarity is when people come together in order to hold the state accountable for not fulfilling its obligations based on the social contract. So national solidarity is when people come together over a cause of justice and morality in order to hold the state accountable for not delivering all the rights and privileges of citizenship to all members of the, of, of the public, of the nation uh, equally. And so it's not a solidarity that is based on material things. 
uh, employment or pay or healthcare costs or those sorts of things, uh, because material interests tend to be too thin to endure, especially when um, you're talking about people who are different in very substantial ways like race or, or gender. And often what we've seen in history is that those with power will pull at our differences as a way of trying to unravel the solidarity of a group so that the institution or whatever doesn't have to deliver on the demands that this multiracial coalition, coalition is making. And we've seen this with, with unions, with strikes, with the postal strike in 1970. I mean, we've, we've seen how, how race and, and uh, these other differences are used to, to um, are exploited and used to, to try to break us. National Solidarity says, this isn't about jobs. This is about equality. This is about the things that we say we hold dear, the values, the principles of our country. And when one of us is not delivered um, th those constitutional protections, those rights in full, then all of us are basically being cheated out of some measure of the promise. And while some will be cheated more than others, certainly um, the fact that any of us are cheated out of the rights that are supposed to define what this nation is about suggests that um, it's an issue worth uh, coming together over and holding the state accountable for being responsive to. So I think it's really important here because something you talk about in the book, which I hope people will buy and read again, because it's so fantastic. You delineate the American promise and the American dream. Mm. And that's so important to this concept. Will you share with folks what, you, what the difference is? Yeah, absolutely. So the American dream is a question of economics. It's a question of social mobility, economic mobility. Um, you know, can you have the house and the picket, white picket fence and the two and a half kids and the garage and that sort of thing? The promise is not about economics. The promise is about recognizing the fundamental basic rights of being a citizen in this country and having those rights um, no matter the condition of your birth, no matter your class, your race, your ethnicity. So the, the promise is the thing that the framers of the Constitution, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, all the, this is what they are talking about uh, in order to either unite the country, save the country, or redeem the country uh, because we've not lived up to our, our founding principles. So it's, it's important because um, if, if this was only about the dream, then this becomes about money. And money is a somewhat finite resource. Then you can start saying, you know, if the more money that's invested in this community and there's a finite pot of it, that means the less money that there's going to be invested in my community. And it turns politics um, into more of a winner takes all, you know, team sports kind of atmosphere. The promise, as you mentioned earlier, there's enough equality for everyone. Equality right. is not zero sum. That by making me your fellow citizen in an egalitarian society, you lose nothing. You actually gain only if you believe in the promise of America. What we're seeing today, and, and we can talk about this more, is that folks are trying to commodify the promise to suggest that mm -hmm. if we accept more people into this country, if we protect the rights of groups that have traditionally been oppressed, then that means there's less of America for you and your family. And all the troubles about jobs living in your community, the, the erosion of institutions, the, the uh, inefficiency of government not being responsive, these sorts of things, it's because those people over there are taking too much of the promise for themselves. And mm -hmm. you can make that case with the dream, it, it, it'll be a bad one, but you cannot make that case with the promise of America if you actually believe in the, in the tenets um, and, and not try to bastardize the principles for, uh, for political gain or, or economic power. Well, and what I hear you saying too is really understanding, and I know you talk about this in the book, I mean, in some ways it's reframing the narrative about America to say, there's, it's not a pie where everybody gets a slice, right? That the promise, I guess you say, it's an ideal, it's a set of values enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, our founding documents, that we all can be part of that story. That's right. Fair? That, yeah. A, absolutely, absolutely. And, but we are, we are watching um, too many folks tie the promise to social status to suggest um, if we extend the promise to others, then your place in society is going to change for the worse. And that's not the America of your grandparents. That's not the America right. that you thought you were being born into. And that's uh, how um, something as beautiful as the promise can be used for a division. Well, in fact, we've seen that in history. I mean, back in the Confederacy, Jim Crow, I'm thinking of, 
the argument by wealthy white landowners to poor white people was, well, you're better than those people and that in this instance, you know, freed slaves because you're white. So by that very fact, you get status. So you're more of an American than those people, right? And as you say, a commodifying, if you will, of the promise. Mm. And Martin Luther King, as we know, in the Poor People's Campaign and others are trying to replicate this have said, let's not do that. Let's, rem let's remember we are all, there's some basic human rights here that we wanna make sure everybody has, a, has access to. Is that right. fair? Analysis, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, but but this, it's also important, like it, this does not suggest that there are no material implications of yeah. realizing an America that lives up to the promise. Um, if you are in a society that is in a that has a racial hierarchy and then suddenly you achieve the promise of America and everyone is equal, those who are at the bottom are now brought level to those who are at the top. And those who are at the top, one will feel a loss of social status because people they used to be better than, or at least um, be, uh, <laughs> right, right, right. They yeah. suddenly feel like uh, now I'm equal to them. And that feels like a demotion instead of a yeah. promotion for those that were oppressed. The other part of it is the, the people, people that you did not have to compete with jobs for, people that you did not have to, to compete to buy housing or to get into colleges. Now with the level playing field, the competition is more because there's more talent and ingenuity that's been brought to the fore and not been bridled by, by structural racism. That may feel like a loss because the competition right. in this country is stiffer uh, because we're not oppressing groups that, that have been uh, historically left out. But that is not a loss. That is the fulfillment of the promise. If the, if the only way you believe you can touch America is to put your boot on the neck of someone else, that ain't America anymore. That's you're, you're living some other uh, set of principles that don't align to our nation's uh, founding text again. So is that the argument then? I mean, what is the argument and the call for those, as you say, because I appreciated just the, the, the stark honesty in this book about here's what it's gonna take, here's what it's gonna look like, which is refreshing. Mm -hmm. What is the, how do you create the sense of urgency in those who, have a certain status who, as you say, may feel or perceive a sense of loss. How do you get their buy-in into this idea? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult because the idea of solidarity, even the idea of the promise um, can feel a little bit like quicksilver sometimes hard to, it's, it, it, it feels um, not tangible, you know, a little abstract. Uh, I know a paycheck feels real. I know how much money I have in my bank account and how much taxes are being taken out, but feeling solidarity or, or um, a group that you don't have deep connections to realizing more of the promise doesn't feel like the same kind of gain in, in a material sense. Uh, so yeah. it, I, I think the, the issue is this, we have watched what has happened in this country when we punt on the hard questions. Um, there were a million casualties uh, killed and wounded during the Civil War because the founding, the revolutionary era generation, the founding generation punted on the issue of slavery. Um, riots across the, the country, uh, protests, police brutality. Uh, so many people have died, bled, sweat, sacrificed in order to touch the promise only because at certain inflection points in our nation's history, we made the wrong choice or we decided mm -hmm. not to choose and, and, and to let time just sort of uh, figure the thing out and, and solve it when, it's, when it sees it's, it's right. So if you don't like the nation you saw on January 6th when a, a horde stormed the Capitol, then you should be invested in multiracial solidarity. If you don't like the fact that um, we had the highest level of participation in a presidential election in 120 years, and immediately the halls of Congress were filled with people debating whether or not the, the, there was fraud or whether the, the election was just and, uh, and, and valid. Um, if you don't like that, we only get more of that unless we do the hard work of creating bonds across difference and establishing solidarity. So the case to all folks is um, if you want to leave a nation to your children that is better than the one you were born into, you cannot avoid this work. Um, and if you need the material case to be made, if you look in, in Appalachia, no one is killing themselves more than white men. 
Um, if you look at the opioid crisis, that is affecting uh, working class and uh, indigent white communities across America more than other places. Black Americans know the story of racial disparity very well across a range of socioeconomic factors. None of us are satisfied with the state of our country today, mostly because we are not satisfied with how government has not been responsive to the things we want to see happen. Everyone wants more affordable healthcare. Everyone wants better educational outcomes for their kids. Everyone wants cheaper college. Everyone wants safer neighborhoods. We all want the same thing, same mm -hmm. things, but um, we are being divided by these folks who would seek to uh, pit us against one another instead of uh, unify us in order to create the America that that's uh, that is in our in our founding documents. Again, that that's the, realizes the promise. Well, and as we are down here, you know, fighting over the scraps, there's other folks right. up here doing just fine with watching us fight over the scraps. So one of the things you do so beautifully in this book is weave through American history, your own family history, stories of incredible Americans. And I want to, on this idea, um, because I do think it was such a, personally, as I experienced it, a moment of superlative citizenship, national solidarity. Some people didn't see it that way, but I, I really think it was. 2008, mm. the night, the election night. And you talk about, and there's two parts to this I want to talk about that you talk about in the book. The speech that Senator John McCain gave mm -hmm. was, I felt, I you know, one of many moments in his life, there certain policy disagreements, no question. But one of many moments in his life where he was heroic and he was, I think he modeled what you talk about in terms of understanding that this moment of electing Barack Obama was bigger than a bitter political fight in, right. the, in an election. Um, but you also talk about that uh, as a shooting star, your words for you, because he invoked the dinner between Booker T. Washington and President Teddy Roosevelt. And so I wonder if you could share for the audience why you chose to, that story on, for, on both as, a, as, a, as an illustrative of the concept, but as part of your own personal story. Right, yeah, um, it, and it really feels important to note that night in contrast to what we saw in this past uh, presidential election yes. where there was no concession, there was no peaceful, uh, there was a somewhat peaceful transfer of power, <laughs> but even the sitting president didn't welcome the, the new president. So, but, but what McCain does the night he gives his concession speech, um, the first thing he says is, look, Barack Obama won, some folks in the crowd start to boo and he says, no, knock it off, not tonight, folks. This is too important. Um, and he does a few things. The first thing is he says, let's just take a moment to recognize the nation has just elected a black man to the presidency. A, a nation with our history is now going to have a black first family in the White House. And no matter what you think of his politics or what you think of, of, uh, of, of the, the other party, this moment is one that the nation should be proud of. And to hear him say that uh, compared to how the parties talk about each other today is remarkable. The second thing he says is that nothing about America is inevitable. And so this, this says that yeah. this night wasn't just going to happen because of the march of time and the goodness and the divine nature of the nation. A lot of people worked to bring this moment about. A lot of people did not live to see this moment come about. It wasn't inevitable, but, but through our perseverance and through our dedication to the promise, it came to, it came to be. And then, the, um, and then he talks about the, how this moment harkens back to the moment where uh, Booker T. Washington is invited to the White House uh, by Teddy Roosevelt. And so when I hear this, uh, you know, it's my name on the book is Theodore R. Johnson. Well, that R is for Roosevelt. I'm Theodore Roosevelt Johnson III. And my name comes from my father, which comes from his father. And my grandfather was given that name in honor of the dinner that Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington had in October of 1901. This dinner was the first time that a black man had been invited to dine at the White House with the first family. Uh, other black men had been to the White House. Frederick Douglass had visited Lincoln, but often through the back door, political meetings, and then sort of ushered out very quietly. This was a very, um, uh, Washington, 
dined with not just Roosevelt, but his family dining together signals a kind of equality. And much of the nation was not happy when word got out that Roosevelt, this new president, uh, only ascended to the presidency after the assassination of McKinley, had broken this norm of having a black man at the White House. But a lot of black sharecroppers in the South, including my great grandparents, Will and Annie Johnson, um, were inspired by the moment, so much so that they named their third son after this rich, white, New Yorker, Republican president, instead of right. after the revered Black educator Booker T. Washington. Um, and this is a almost as a claim on the promise that they saw nothing ironic or ridiculous about a poor Black sharecropping family having a child named after a president um, who would sit in the White House and hold the reins of the nation in his hands. Uh, this was their claim on America too. And, and that name is, uh, has, has carried through the, the last century or so in my family. So that, that moment in McCain's speech um, was important for so many reasons. Um, the, but the, the other part of this is if you look at uh, Obama's response, both men are calling the nation to do two things, to put their eyes on the promise as our guiding star yes. and to form solidarity across difference, political, ideological, racial, ethnic, in order to realize the promise. Both men call for the very same thing. And, uh, and I, 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 even though that moment of national unity didn't endure very long, uh, the, soon the cold calculus of partisan politics uh, visited the Obama White House and, and we sort of got us on a, a particular Avenger. path. But that night yeah. was incredibly important to give us a glimpse of what it could look like with principled leadership and uh, and folks who put the country before themselves. It's, it's, well, it's, so, it's, a, it's a beautifully written part of the book. Um, and I, I love that you brought that into this, both again, because of the personal story. And I love reading about Will and Annie because they are, you know, throughout the, the, the story, but also it struck me that, you know, obviously not long after that, President Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize. We had this ridiculous conversation, this commentary about being post-racial, which was sort of missing the point, right. uh, I think, which again, I think the book illustrates like, that's not the point. The point is there was a mo this moment, and I always thought there was a lost opportunity in this country and, there, mm -hmm. and perhaps in, in your construct to say, even if you didn't vote for him, be proud that we did that right. and be proud. And this goes into something that you talk about in other parts of the book. The rest of the world saw that we did that. Um, and that that has a bigger meaning than just our typical day-to-day -day partisan battles, that there is something bigger that we can be unified and called to. And one of the things that you talk about that's so important and I want to talk about this in the concept of black solidarity. We don't all have to agree right. to have this unity. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's so important because when we talk about solidarity, whether it's black solidarity or national solidarity, I think people tend to hear, well, what about all the people I don't agree with? Right. And that's not what you're saying. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the lessons, um, so there's there's three that I build out from Black America uh, that the nation would be wise to adopt. One is superlative citizenship. Another is trickle down citizenship. And this third idea is a kind of social solidarity. And so among Black Americans, the solidarity that we see is too often reduced to Black people, 90% of Black people vote for the Democrat in presidential elections. That's their solidarity, that their group think it's their sheep, and they're, um, they all want the same thing out of government, which, of course, is the furthest thing from the truth. What The, the kind of solidarity we see in, in Black America results from, from this. It, it's an outgrowth of this. Um, when Black people first came to this country, they spoke different languages, they practiced different religions, different customs, cultures. They weren't all just one monolithic group of Black people from Sub-Saharan Africa that came over here and practiced the same solidarity they developed there. They were, they were folks that were extremely different, different tribes, dialects, et cetera. And when they came here, it was under the vice of slavery or in the vice of slavery that this, this disparate set of Black people became the African-American. And in this country, when you are born black, you are born into this history. And so you don't choose solidarity with other black people. You are born into it because the, the black experience in America has always required that if you want to do well as a black person, the group has to do well. 
And the only way, the easiest way to know whether or not you've got a good shot in America is to look at how America treats black people. And then if you're black, right. you know, the, the, in, it's not enough for you to be educated while the rest of the group is being oppressed. It's not enough for you to have money while the rest of the group is being disenfranchised and, and cut out of the, you know, economic security. Um, and, and so the, the, that kind of solidarity is, is one that be, is, a, um, is, is one that you, it's, you, you, you form it with people you don't choose. And so this is the same that can be said for America. And we've seen this in other places. And you go to a place where there's been a natural disaster, those folks have a kind of social solidarity. None of them chose to be subject to a hurricane or tornado, but through the yeah. struggle of recovery, there was a solidarity. If you look at folks who have survived um, diseases and they, you know, my mother was a longtime breast cancer survivor. She found solidarity with other survivors because of the traumatic mm -hmm. experience. America, we have a traumatic history. Most of us did not choose to be American. Some did. Um, immigrants come to the country all the time. The majority of us were born citizens. We didn't choose our affiliation with one another. We didn't choose our nationality, but we were born into it, into the same history. And so we should build on the solidarity of being American as a, as a foundation for finding what we have in common, recognizing that we are one people, but not requiring us to whitewash ourselves of differences to be colorblind, to agree on every policy thing, but instead to recognize that difference is beautiful um, and we can still be have unity uh, alongside that difference. We don't have to choose to either agree on everything or nothing. You know, that's such a powerful idea because again, and you talk about this a bit in the book, different social constructs of like the melting pot and and the concerns, well, that, that's going to is that going to blur our differences? And, and, and the fact that the story of America has been ever expanding and, and who is American and what is the American story, right. um, whether you are a Native American, a Korean American who fought in the Korean War, a Japanese American who fought in World War II and whose family might have been interned. Exactly. Um, the what, LGBTQ Americans in our current, you know, I mean, there are, so many different groups of Americans and this idea of a solidarity around, again, as you say, a higher purpose, which doesn't mean we're not still different. Right. So I wanna lay the, try this idea on you. And just as a reminder, I see we're getting some questions in the, in the queue. We are gonna get to your questions in just a moment, but I gotta lay this one on Ted because I've been thinking about it. <laughs> so again, because I'm a storyteller, I love in the book where you talk about John Jay and the way that our founding fathers tried to kind of sell the story, like get people on board with, uh, you know, the, the founding documents and basically tried to sell a story about national unity that sort of, and took liberties with the facts, let's be honest. Right. But basically, as you say, they tried to say, well, we're one united people and one religion and similar manners and customs. And even back then, that was just not true. Right. You had slaves, women. Hey, <laughs> we weren't even part of the calculus in the beginning. <laughs> Black women in particular. I um, feel like I got to take up for my people. <laughs> you know, Native Americans, again. But that, I wonder what you think about, like, if that, that seems like, in the construct of your book, such a foundational moment. That what if in that moment the decision had been made to say instead trying to make it all fit into one box that most didn't really fit into look we're all here for different reasons but we're here and we can unify around again as you talk about we won't get a chance to get too much into it this sort of american civil religion and our, mm. our founding documents right, right. I wonder if you think that is part of the task now to reframe the story to say something like, um, look, we're all different, but we're unified and we don't have to agree. We just have to agree that the American promise is the goal, is the most precious thing that we all have a role in making a possibility for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that, that John Jay, I, I just, it's, it's amazing to me. It's in Federalist Paper 
2, I believe, is where he writes this. And he's basically trying to convince people in New York and New Jersey. I know those people in South Carolina might look a little different and talk different and et cetera, but don't allow the Brits to tell you that we're not one people. We are one people. We speak the same language. We, we practice the same religion, have the same customs, cultures, et cetera. And he basically tried to say, we are one people despite the, dif the differences between the states. Um, I, it would have been more powerful uh, one, if he had acknowledged sort of how gender wasn't wasn't factored in, how race wasn't wasn't factored into his his comment, but if he said we are one people, but who are connected in spite of their difference, you know that mm -hmm. we are connected over our belief in equality and life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, but we are different peoples coming together over this idea, not that we are the same peoples, and so um, you know the nation is worth worth founding, you know the the. The motto, out of many, one, e pluribus unum, um, I think it's good, but it's incomplete. Out of many, one. And then I would say, but many still. Uh, there's mm -hmm. lots of us. And we are one people. If you've ever flown out of the country and returned to an American airport, when you step into that airport, you feel America. It's, it's indescribable. Mm -hmm. You just, you kind of know, even if it's not your home state, even if you land in New York and you have to catch up, you know, playing back to Iowa or wherever, when you hit New York, you kind of know, I'm home, I'm back, I'm back in my country. And it's that feeling I think we should build on instead and, and recognize that um, we don't have to uh, erase differences in order to build on our feeling of sameness, of commonality, of shared uh, culture and, and nationality. Uh, we can be different and still be united. It's very difficult to do, especially in a multiracial democracy like ours. No one's ever succeeded in doing this before. We're trying to do something the world's not seen. Uh, it's, right. so, it's so it's hard, but we have the potential to, to bring this thing, to make it real. And whether we are up to the challenge or not remains to be seen. So let's talk about another one of the key concepts in the book in terms of how we overcome racism, because I think this is such at the crux of it. You talk about racism as a crime of the state. And I'd love for you to expand on that because what you meant by that is not actually when I was first reading about the book and then read the book, again, I'm trying to make a picture to read the book. Um, <laughs> it wasn't what I thought you were gonna say. And it was pretty revolutionary, pretty, you know, really a very fresh take on how we should think about this. Yeah, so too often racism is seen as being a thing that happens between white people and people of color. And it's a thing that white people do to people of color. And in this construction, this means that racism is a problem between groups and that the only way we can fix it is for those groups to have a sit down and work through their problems and figure it all out, have that national conversation on race and then have a kumbaya moment and then go off and be American together. Um, that structural racism doesn't work that way. This is not about relationships between groups. This is about the way our society is structured where one group or a collection of groups have a easier time of being American, an easier time of being a citizen, uh, more of their rights and privileges uh, protected than other groups uh, simply because of their class or their, their race or ethnicity. So if, if, if this is about our, the way our society is structured and the way that we modify and amend our structures is through public policy, then if we still live in a nation where racial inequality persists, then it is up to government to implement good public policy to erase those discriminatory uh, impacts or, or discriminatory um, elements of our that are in our, our national structures. So this is why I call it a crime of the state. Racism is something that the nation state allows to persist, to endure, because it's in its interest not to be too disruptive uh, in order to, um, you know, and, and, and not deliver fully on the promise to everyone. Instead to uh, sort of um, keep the people at a point where they can't be united and de make uh, large demands on the nation state and then would require that the nation sort of alter its course and do different things because uh, of, of how um, the people have come together. The, the declaration says we are a nation, um, the, the government derives its power from the consent of the governed. Solidarity is the means by which we provide that consent. But uh, the, the nation state isn't interested in that moral principled claim. It's, it's, a, it's an entity, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's mm -hmm. not a being. And so it's only concerned with its interests. And as such, um, just as uh, you know, when these sort of conditions of inequality as they endure, uh, it is up to the state to fix it. And when it doesn't, 
it's a crime of the state when it when it continues to to uh, last. Well, I thought it was so powerful though that you talked about and talking about this. And again, I'm biracial. My mom's white. My dad's black, and it is a tough line to walk. And I feel like I've seen both sides of it. Part of what I thought was so powerful in this idea of reframing this as a crime of the state, it takes us out of the realm of guilt and mm. shame and acknowledges, and I would love you to talk about this because you talk about acknowledging that structural racism is doing harm to white people too. Right. And that's, and I think a lot of times when we talk about racism and structural racism, you know, we forget it is a soul wound for, and a generational wound. And I'm not excusing, just for those watching, I'm not excusing the Ku Klux Klan and bad behavior. Right. But I am saying people on all sides are harmed by this in, in ways they may not even know. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I thought that was really a powerful idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so if, if, if racism is made to be a thing between people, between groups, um, it keeps us divided. And again, the, the state doesn't have to be responsive. The, but when the state's not responsive, we are all harmed by what it's not doing. Um, this, th this idea that um, if, 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 uh, if I could just get my America together, um, then there will be more of, more, you know, the, that everyone could also partake of it is, uh, is, is not one that is, is proven true over, over time. It's instead the story we're sold is that the reason you don't have the America you want or that or, or the America that your, your parents had is because someone else is infringing on, on that America. Um, and, and so when we take the focus off of what one group is doing to another group, and think of more. Think more about what the state needs to do in order to fulfill its obligations uh, in the social contract. Now we are not bickering amongst one another to fight for the same America that the vast majority of us want. We are now working together to demand the America that most of us want, uh, and and demand that the the nation deliver, the government deliver on that America. So it reframes racism from being an issue between people to being issue an issue between the people and their government and their nation state. And now we can be hard on those institutions and processes and, uh, and instead of demonizing one another and vilifying each other as being responsible for, you're the reason that my community doesn't have good schools or you're the reason why um, you know, jobs are leaving my community. All of that, all that does is allow those who already have power to hold on to it and uh, for all of us to be cheated out of the promise. Right, I, again, I think that's a powerful idea and that you're, and just to be clear, you're not saying, tell me if I'm wrong, that the real pain that people feel in the experience of racism isn't very real and needs to be dealt with. You're simply reframing, how do we solve this right. as a problem that threatens America? It, that's exactly right. Yeah. Right. I'm not excusing folks who, who actually hold racial hatred in their hearts. I'm not, right. I'm not, um, sort of short, giving short shrift to the real pain and lived experiences of those who've been subject to racism, either the interpersonal kind or the structural kind in terms of health disparities, wealth disparities, et cetera. But if we want to work ourselves out of this problem, then uh, we have to turn to public policy to do so. And that requires the state take action. And the only way the state will do so is if the people stand in solidarity with one another. So when I, when I go to some of our, our questions, um, we have a question. You talk about national solidarity in the book. What do you believe President Biden and other leaders need to do to promote national solidarity? Yeah, it's really it's really tough. And so one, I think Biden's uh, President Biden's rhetoric about this is about the soul of America. I think that's right. I think those are the right words. That this is not about um, what the 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 marginal tax rate will be or what the interest rates will be or inflation. This is a, the, the real question for our country is about our soul, our character, our identity. But that feels a little nebulous at times and people immediately turn to policy differences, et cetera. So the rhetorical pitches alone 
are insufficient. And we learned that with President Obama. I mean, he tried to be very uh, unifying in his speech from 2004 forward and was often met with brick walls for folks that, that wanted to stonewall the things he was trying to do from a political uh, policy perspective. So mm -hmm. here's what I think um, the, the presidential administration can do as well as at the states and localities. And I, I talk about some of these ideas at the end of the book um, about yeah. how we can manufacture um, national solidarity, how we can create conditions conducive to the arising of national solidarity. One is democracy reform, and the, and the Congress is talking about this issue right now around the For the People Act. Whether you agree with everything in it or not, the, the, the polling shows that something like two-thirds of Americans believe, and this is the majority of Democrats and Republicans, that our yes. democracy is overdue fundamental redesign. So we may disagree on what that redesign looks like, but we all agree that what the present version of it isn't working. So we have to reform our democracy to be more participatory, more inclusive, protect voting rights, get big money out of politics, stop gerrymandering, all those things that make government responsive to the will of the people and not um, uh, allow folks to cheat at the game and, and, uh, and sort of undermine uh, the, the express will of the, folk, uh, of the people. And then the, the other four recommendations I make that I'll run through very quickly. The next sure. is civic education. Uh, this isn't about whether people know how many branches of government there are or whether who their congressperson is. This is we are not trained how to be good citizens in a democracy. Um, more than voting, more than paying taxes, do we know how to be good citizens in a democracy? We are not taught that. Civic education comprehensively um, will help us do that. And I think a program that um, puts that not just in K through 12, but all the way through in our libraries, our churches, our you know, high school auditoriums for adults to, to get refreshers or, or training or education on how to be better citizens. The, the third thing is national service. Uh, I'm a retired military guy, so I recognize the value of being working uh, on a mission with people you would never meet otherwise, except for the fact that you're both serving. I think uh, bringing Americans together across difference, uh, helping them work together for a, a bigger cause will break down some of the, the walls um, that exist between us. Uh, the fourth thing is deliberative democracy. And this is when, not, this isn't just town halls, but when town halls turn into deliberations about what should be done. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the, the assembly comes to an agreement uh, through voting or whatever on what should be done. And then that agreement is binding for the, gover the, the government. Uh, in Pittsburgh, they have had citizen assemblies hire the police chief. In um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, citizens determine how the city's budget should come together and then the city council executes it. So these are, you are working with your federal citizens on how to do democracy in a way that forces you to see them as your fellow citizen, first of all, but all, and recognize their humanity, but also um, understand the, the value of compromise, of incrementalism, you know, sort of, uh, of recognizing you can't, everyone can't get everything tomorrow. So what can we agree to do that will make it a little bit better for all of us? And then the last thing is sort of where the question opens up and it's transformative leadership. We still require uh, citizen exemplars as a, a way of demonstrating, modeling for us what it looks like to fulfill the, the, uh, our duties as citizens and to move us closer to the promise of America. Those are the five things I think the, uh, this administration, but generally the nation should do in order to bring this kind of solidarity about. You know, I wanna pick up on uh, national service and some of these ideas about solidarity because you know, I think a lot about, my father was a civil rights attorney and you talk a lot of in the book, <clears throat> excuse me, about different points in the civil rights movement and the approaches. And part, I have this, I remember having this conversation with him after the death of Ro the Rodney King riots. And this is a man who worked to legislate opportunity. And he said, he was so depressed. And he said, you know, we thought if we legislate the access, the opportunity, that if you're sitting in schools next to each other, you're working next to each other, that the rest is going to come along, that the heart, you know, that, that that will help win the hearts and minds. Mm. And essentially he was saying, I think we were wrong. And, and you know, and I, my answer to him was, I think we need both and. Mm. And what strikes me in the book is you talk about both how we change the reframe the narrative 
and the structure in the solutions, the solutions also seem, the solutions seem to be a bit of a both and um, in that they, they also give citizens more buy-in to the success of the American promise, not just buy-in because I'll live more rights and freedoms, but buy-in because I'm playing an active role right. in making it happen. And I'm, so I'm wondering if what you think about that in terms of the solutions you just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's the exposure to one another. It's the working together to come up with solutions and, uh, and recognizing that uh, the only way any of us sort of get our, the, what we want from this country, what we want out of our lives is, is, to, is this coming together. But it's a really important point about like the, the, the limits of legislation, but the importance of it. Um, it mm -hmm. With in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed. We had a group of enslaved people who were now citizens and the men of which uh, can now vote. And within two or three decades, that right was effectively taken away. We passed a number of civil rights acts from the late 19th century all the way through to the Civil Rights Act of 64. And in 1964, in that presidential election, the vast majority of Black people in the Deep South still could not vote 100 years after the end of the Civil War. It wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 65 that suddenly voter registration now uh, comes up. And so uh, even when we pass good constitutional amendments, when we pass good legislation, when we, uh, when the Supreme Court finds that, it's like for example, racial segregation is unconstitutional, those are really important. When the when President Truman desegregates the federal workforce and the military by executive order in 1948, really important. And yet, Jim Crow still lived on after the military was desegregated. Um, schools today are still almost as racially segregated as they were when Brown v. Board was decided. Uh, and so we have taken the right policy steps to create a, an America closer to the one in our, our founding documents. But we as a people have not been willing to sacrifice or practice the forbearance necessary to live out the principles in our country. And this is why we always have to return. This is why the For the People Act is so necessary because the, the rights that should have been granted um, in the 15th and 19th amendments, frankly, are still being challenged uh, right. by, by folks who, who would seek to shape the electorate, electorate to their advantage. And so it's right. never enough to just have legislation, never enough to just have exposure, but if you have exposure and common goals and good policy, and principled leadership and an educated and engaged citizenry, then you have a chance at creating an America that lives up to the promise. So that goes to a couple of great questions we have from, the, from audience members. Here's one, what can average citizens do to help facilitate national solidarity and the American promise? Yeah, this is a tough question, um, and it's it's one that comes up a lot because people they tell me, "I hear you, I buy it. Um, what do right. I do tomorrow?" Right. You know, you we know, and this is do list, exactly it's like tell me what to do, man. I'm I here. know, I know, and it's just not. If it was that easy, um, someone would have had this answer in in you know 1800s, <laughs> and, and, and we would have we would have been a better a better nation for it. So here's what I here's what I say. Um, the biggest one of the biggest issues is that we don't know each other. That we are a nation of 330 million democratic strangers trying to make this democracy work. And if we're not, without unity, democracy doesn't work because again, we're always at each other's throats. One of the biggest reasons um, is because we don't, that we don't know each other is that our social circles are, are homogenous. If you look at our yeah. neighborhoods, the schools our kids go to, who your Facebook friends are, they tend to look a lot like you. And in this way, um, we, we now don't have connections across difference. Something like, um, you know, three of, in four Americans don't have a single person of another race in their immediate social circle. We don't, we don't know each other. So what can we do? I think we have to put ourselves in spaces where we are not the majority, put ourselves in places mm. where we have to be with people who are not like us and live with that discomfort until we become comfortable. And it will not be easy. It will be, um, it will be very easy to just check out of it and say, I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna pay my taxes and, and vote for good candidates. And that'll be the extent of my contribution to the country. It's not gonna work that way. We have to get out of our comfort zones and force ourselves to interact with other people 
with whom we're trying to build the nation of our uh, of th that can live up to the promise. And so that's something we can do tomorrow. Find the club, the running group, the book club, the church, the, whatever your thing is, and, and yeah. join one where everyone in that group doesn't look like you. And, and, uh, right. and, and then, and, and, and don't give up on it. Well, and I'd argue, talk to someone in, you know, in line at the grocery store. We're doing mm -hmm. that again now, right? There are other spaces now where we're maybe coming into contact with people that are different than ourselves um, and having that open heart to say, I want to hear <clears throat> what's going on with you right. in a way that this goes to another question. And again, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to thank our audience for sticking with us. We have, we're in our closing few minutes here. I'm going to do another audience question. Then I'm going to go back to a couple final questions for Ted. So to this point, where do you start to help people understand that, yes, we are different, but we are all here wanting the same things out of life? How do you have that conversation with those who not, might not be willing to even try to understand that. So you just talked, we just talked a bit about, let's get out of our comfort zone. Let's talk to people that are different. But then also I feel like I'm hearing this question that says, but even maybe within our comfort zone, how do we have some of these conversations? Because I think when we start talking, I think this is one of the things, frankly, we saw a lot of news about this coming in the aftermath of the George Floyd videotape being public, a lot of people who might have been not the best time when you're sequestered because of COVID right. to find out the person you're married to or you're you know, with has some real different ideas. But I think it's a really great question. How do we even have that kind of those conversations with people who maybe not interested or able to have that conversation? Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, there are a few uh, like there's um deep canvassing is a a tactic that some campaigns are beginning to use, where mm -hmm. you you sort of win people over not by talking about your preferred candidate or a particular issue, but just getting to understand them and what they care about. And I think yeah. that's instructive for for how to engage broadly instead of engaging to prove that you're right or to help people see your side of the the argument. We should be engaging to understand other people better. And in this way, um, if, if, if they feel like the only reason you're talking to them is because you want to tell them how wrong they are, then all you're going to meet is resilience to whatever it is you're talking about, even if they would see the light you know, through the data or whatever your argument is. And so the, the best way to engage in these situations, I think, is just to understand the things that people care about. What are their concerns? If, if they you know, saw the George Floyd's murder differently than the vast majority of the nation did, understand why. And you'll often learn that it has nothing to do with George Floyd and probably nothing even to do with police. But the sense that um, the, the respect for authority or respect for rules in our society are breaking down. And I don't like the, the sense that all of the, the set of rules I grew up under are now changing. And that yeah. is a different conversation than do you think that white police officer was racist for murdering George Floyd. And so that latter framing um, doesn't create any, you don't build any bridges that way. Um, the former framing will allow you to eventually begin to talk about the racial dynamics at play in that encounter, but uh, do so in a way where you don't lead with that. You lead rather with trying to understand the thing at the core of what that person is concerned about. Right. You know, it's such a great point. One of the things I found in some of the research I did in 2020, the work on, we were looking actually at racism as a political issue. Mm. And the thing we, I think we oftentimes have to remember, and I think this is true for sexism and pick your -ism, If it's not something that you experience every day, it's abstract. Right. So part of the conversation is also breaking it down to the level of story of, you know, tell me your story. Right. Or when we talk to people about, I mean, there was something about George Floyd, and I know you've talked about this as a moment of national solidarity, because I think a lot of people looked at that and said, whoa, that's not who I want this country to be. But I think there's also this element in this conversation you're talking about where it is at the level of narrative to say, 
look, structural racism, here's how it works. Here's a story that can give people an entry point to say, oh, well, that's not good. Right. That's not the promise, uh, to put it in, in your terms. So, gosh, there's so much more we could talk about that we didn't even get to. <laughs> but um, we didn't even get to talk about, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Very quickly, color conscious versus colorblind. Such an important concept. And I think it goes back again to this idea, to this John Jay story, this like how we sell the story. Mm. And again, acknowledging our differences and not, you know, whitewashing or painting over them, but really saying, no, we have to. Can you talk about that concept from the book? Yeah, absolutely. And so we hear this all the time. People point to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech where he says, you know, I want, you know, a world where we're not judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And they interpret that meaning that the fulfillment of the American promise is a colorblind meritocratic society. And that is not it. He, you know, King said, I don't want my kids to be judged by the color of their skin. But he didn't say that he didn't want their color of his skin to, to not be present, to not matter. I mean, he still wanted to have black kids. You know, he just didn't want <laughs> to be judged for being black. So the, a color conscious society is one that recognizes racial and ethnic differences and doesn't require people to shed those group identities in order to be part of this larger American identity. Colorblindness suggests your subgroup identity, your racial group, your gender group, those things don't matter. Or, you know, that we can be colorblind. We don't have to see color. We don't have to see race. We can all just be American and then build from that, that common point. What Color Conscious says is um, the Black experience in America is not the Native experience. And the Native experience in America is not the, the poor white uh, ap experience in Appalachia. And so if we try to create a nation um, by doing uniform things for all people, no matter their histories, their trajectories, their paths, their group um, stories, we're not going to make the nation stronger because we're not meeting the needs of particular peoples given their set of uh, experiences or history or circumstances. So in a color, if we approach America in a color conscious fashion, now we address the specific needs of black Americans based on our very specific American history, the specific needs of, of you know, the, the hillbilly elegy crowd based on their history mm -hmm. in America, the specific needs of immigrants and of Native Americans, et cetera. And you have to do that in a color conscious fashion. And the last thing I'll say, color blindness is the easy way out to say all those things that we went to war over and fought over, let's just forget they ever existed. And tomorrow we'll be friends and skip off into the sunset together. Color <laughs> consciousness says, we are going to do the hard work of seeing that we are different and loving each other anyway, accepting difference and standing in solidarity, even though we have different stories. The power in that is the thing is, is really where the promise of America resides. It's and it also is the thing that makes this really difficult to do. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. And I love that there's so much hopefulness in that. And I so this is where I'm going to as we close, uh, the last question I want to ask you, um, you know, when the stars begin to fall, obviously comes from a Negro spiritual, which I'll ask you to, for those in our audience who may not know that one, <laughs> explain that. Um, because again, I love how you wove, you know, black history into and lifted it up as a model mm. um, of hope and promise for this country. So as you explain when the stars begin to fall, where that comes from, could you end by, I'd like to end with, what gives you hope that the stars will fall in the right place? Right. Yeah, so the, the title, um, When the Stars Begin to Fall, as you said, comes from a spiritual, it's, you know, my Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. And the song was supposed to be about, in, in Christian theology, about the rapture, the day when, you know, all the believers sort of ascend to heaven to live uh, there ever after. Um, and so the stars are falling, people are ascending, and this is the end of the world as, as the prophecy is fulfilled. But what the song is actually about uh, are enslaved Black people singing for emancipation, for their freedom, for their liberty. And they were forbidden from doing so 
because they, 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 they could not speak their minds, you know, on a plantation, like we don't want to be here. We want our freedom. We want our liberty. So they had to cloak their desire for freedom in Christian themes, which they were permitted to sing about. So this is a song about a, an enslaved people only wanting to be uh, recognized as the Americans that they were only wanting, not, not wanting power over other people, just wanting equality, just wanting life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That's it. And nothing is more American. That is the spirit of 1776. There's nothing more American than that, that urge. And so this is where the, the, the title comes from, but it also means um, we are at an inflection point now, I believe, where either we can make the right choice, and, and as you said, the stars can sort of fall into place as we take the next step to fulfilling the promise of America, or the stars can kind of fall out of the sky as we make the wrong choices, the selfish choices, and then the, I the idea of America begins to collapse mm -hmm. on itself as we now sort of, it turns into a Hunger Games about who gets the, the full rights and privileges of citizenship <laughs> over, over others. We, you know, the thing that gives me hope if, if enslaved Black people uh, for centuries could wake up each morning and still believe that maybe their children will have a better existence than, than I did, willing to run away from plantations to freedom or to run away to fight in the military in the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 to fight for the nation's independence and freedom as a claim on their own, if they can have hope and optimism for tomorrow, you know, who am I to, to not? And so it's sort of uh, that the the one of the other lessons from Black America is having faith and optimism in the American experiment, despite all evidence to the contrary, and for mm -hmm. all of its imperfections, that faith and optimism of previous generations has pushed the nation closer to the promise. And uh, I think it's our turn to carry the mantle uh, uh, and being still very being very sober about our challenges, but being optimistic that the nation can meet them. And uh, but it is up to us. And it remains to be seen if we will make the right choices or not, if we will sacrifice for one another and, and for posterity, or if we will show that we are not the people we thought we were and choose a different path that will ultimately take us away from the ideals of America and into something else that is something uh, far less valuable. Well, thank you so much, Ted. Thank you everyone um, for, for joining us. You know, Ted, I'll just end by saying what gives me hope is that um, new ideas like what you have put forward in this book, which I know was a labor of love over a very long period of time. I read <laughs> right. it, it came to you in lots of different ways, but to have some fresh ideas that say this, yes, this is a problem that has been with us from the beginning, but there is a way forward mm -hmm. that is not around it. You know, again, I think, you know, something that I've said when people say, this isn't who we are. Yes, this is who we are, but it's not who we have to be. Right. And I think this book says, here's how we do better. Here's how we don't have to be um, some of the images and things we've seen in recent years that, you know, break all of our hearts. So I, I really thank you for this book. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for sticking with us. Thank you to the Brennan Center. Thank you to Politics and Prose. Please be sure to buy the book. I'm sure I saw the link going in the chat a few times. Um, so I hope folks will buy the, the book. Um, and Sean, I hand it back over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Finney. I do, however, have one last question very briefly, <laughs> and this is for okay. the both of you. Um, if you could just share with our audience, um, if you're currently reading anything, and if you are, could you just tell everyone what that is at home? Well, I just finished, and you can see when I said I felt like I was in grad school, all my pages marked um, and underlined, and I really, so, um, I don't know, maybe something a little lighter will come next. <laughs> uh, not really. I'm, so I'm reading um, Frederick Douglass's uh, biography by David Blight, and also mm -hmm. uh, Notes on Grief uh, by Chumam... Ch you know, Chumamanda uh, Adichie, um, mm -hmm. who uh, she recently lost her father and wrote about 60, 70 page short book on the grieving process. And so those are the two things on my nightstand at the moment. Well, I'd like to thank you both for this very informative discussion. Of course, everyone out there, please go buy yourself a few copies of When the Stars Begin to Fall. 
Um, mm -hmm. For everyone who's joined us, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we wish everyone to stay well and stay well read. Hope everyone has a good day. Thank you.